Thank you for joining the Cozy Mystery Quartet. I'm M.L. Erdahl, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Wendy Kendall, Susan McCormick, and Linda Hope Lee. Every writer faces different challenges on how to manage their time. Whether it's working a nine to five, raising children, or spending time with your loved ones. Not to mention those pesky habits of sleeping and eating, trying to find time to write can be exhausting. And here is an inconvenient reality. It gets harder once your book is published. Even if you are picked up by one of the big five publishers, you are the number one marketing force for your work. Stephen King and Marker Atwood spend time performing readings, conducting interviews, and posting on social media, and so will you. Where do you think this chunk of time will come from? That's correct. It's coming out of your invaluable writing time. Finding a balance that works is a topic of endless debate among the writing community. Non-writers might envision authors sitting in a classy bar, sipping cocktails, and discussing literature when we get together. But more likely, our discussions will be a how do you manage to keep up discussion while we share a cup of coffee. The Cozy Mystery Quartet is here to share our experiences. Your life will most certainly be different than ours, but I hope you can find similarities and apply what we've learned to help you on your journey. To help give context to my own life, I work a standard 40-hour work week, Monday through Friday. I'm married and don't have children other than those with paws. My wife is extremely supportive of my writing and picks up more than her share of housework to give me the extra time I need. With this kind of support, it is easy to go overboard and dedicate an exorbitant amount of hours to writing, and I did just that when I began my first novel. However, it was an exhausting pace. I missed spending time with my pets and wife. I wasn't keeping up with my health, and I kept sacrificing sleep for writing. It was a classic case of treating this like a sprint rather than a marathon. Recognizing the signs of burnout on the horizon, my wife and I reorganized the schedule. We've tinkered with it plenty, but what works for me is putting in several hours on Saturday and dedicating all of Sunday to writing. This leaves the work week and most of Saturday for everything else I want to do in life. As to the writing time, it's easy to lose yourself in the endless mire of social media and marketing since there are countless rabbit holes to dive down on the internet to gain exposure for your work. I typically dedicate the lion's share of my hours to marketing prior to and during a book launch, but taper that down about a month or so after the release. Then, like an invisible switch, I return most of my efforts to writing and editing my next book. After all, as my editor once told me, the best marketing you can do is come out with another book. Linda, can you share some tips on how you keep your writing life on the right track? Thank you, Michael. I found that writing a story or a book is much more than just putting words on paper or on the computer screen, but let's start with that. First is composing the initial draft. When you face the blank page with your fingers poised over the keyboard or with pen or pencil in hand. The next stage is editing and rewriting. For both the initial draft and the rewriting, I try to reserve time early in the morning before my day has begun. Other sessions I work in throughout the day and evening whenever the opportunity arises. I might have a couple hours in the afternoon or the evening when I can work on a story or a novel. I have to say that I enjoy the rewriting more than the first draft. Some writers I know are just the opposite. The first draft is more fun than the rewriting. So while these are the two times when actual writing is done, there are other occasions when my writer's brain is on the job. I call this mental writing. For example, I find describing characters a particular challenge. So when possible, I study people in my environment and think of the words I would use to describe them in a book or story. One good place to do this is while standing in a line somewhere, say at a grocery store. Of course, I do this discreetly. Another occasion for such mental writing is while I'm taking my daily walks. During these times when the situation allows, I like to think of words I would use to describe the setting in a story. I always carry a camera with me so that I can record the scene for later reference and study. I try to use all the senses, sight, sound, smell, and touch. Then there are occasions at home when such mental writing may be done. 
while performing household tasks such as dishwashing or floor sweeping, I might turn my thoughts to my current work in progress and sketch out a scene in my mind. In all of this mental writing, I focus on the words I would use to describe the person or the object or the action or the emotion. After all, we writers use words to communicate our ideas to others, and therefore the words we choose are very important. So, I would suggest that you view your writing as more than just the act of putting words on the computer screen or on paper. Incorporating mental writing into other activities in your daily life will make your job easier when you actually sit down to write the story. Wendy, can you tell us how you budget your time? That is great advice, Linda. Yes, an author's life. Uh, Take it from the Beatles, a brief excerpt shared on YouTube by Vivo. Yes, I really wanted to be a paperback writer, and I've been surprised and delighted and overwhelmed with the life it's brought. I love it. Fitting everything in requires time management, work, eagerness to learn new things, and compassion with yourself when you cannot get everything done that you want to get done when you want to. Prioritize and then forgive yourself. There's always tomorrow. That's true for everyone, not just authors. The joy truly is in the journey. Unlike the Beatles paperback writer, Not all authors' works make millions. So, like so many others, I have a day job that consumes a lot of energy and time. In my remaining time for being an author, I'm honing my writing craft, writing more books, interacting with readers, marketing my books, and learning more about how to market my books. I want to reach more and more readers because I'm so excited to share my stories and the characters in them. In addition to my book and prequel, I have another novella mystery slash romance expected to publish the end of this year. I'm juggling those things with time spent with family and friends and pursuing other personal interests. It's an exhilarating life. The best surprise has been the incredible people I'm meeting and am friends with. These are readers of my books, other writers, editors, and others I've met along the way. I embrace the advice I heard from Garth Stein, author of The Art of Racing in the Rain and other works. He advised, don't give up your life in order to write. You need to experience life to be a writer. Susan, how are you balancing life? So true. Thank you, Wendy. I've been writing a long time, through small children, then teenagers, through three dogs, through a career as a doctor, and now this year, being newly retired. As a doctor and a mom, time was always in short supply. In Seattle in the summer, the sun rises at 4.30 a.m., shining bright into my bedroom and waking me up. For years, on weekends I wasn't working, I wrote in those early morning hours before my family woke up. My giant, black, fluffy, silent Newfoundland dog, Albert, would dutifully pad downstairs with me and lie by my side as my constant writing companion. In the winter, it was harder because it was dark and cold, and I'd have to set an alarm. Having that warm, steady dog next to me made all the difference. I wrote three full books plus a picture book this way. Time was so short that when I was writing, I was writing, no matter what. Then I retired, and soon after, my beautiful dog died my muse. Now I could write all day, but I was alone. But not really. Like every other household in the world, ours was upended by COVID. Suddenly everyone was home, everyone needed a space, Wi-Fi, breakfast or lunch, all at different times due to different school schedules. All the glorious hours of alone time I'd planned when I was dreaming of retirement didn't really happen. But we settled into a routine. One son went back to college and I wrote an entire book in less than half a year, book three of The Fog Ladies. As far as marketing, this is the bane of most writers. We write, we love to write, but we have no training or natural ability in the marketing department. I didn't even have Facebook or Instagram or Twitter when my first book came out. Now I do. 
I write guest blog posts on cozy mystery sites. I do podcasts. I join book clubs. I give talks. I enjoy each of these more than the social media part. The guest blogs are fun, especially if I'm writing in the voice of a character. Podcasts are wonderfully exhilarating. I just recorded a more than one hour one for my upcoming middle grade fantasy. And we talked about everything from my stint in the army to ghosts. My favorite though are book clubs and talks. I've done several of these with some book clubs making food from the book, like the chili that contained the poison to kill Sarah or the egg custards Mrs. Noonan fed the policeman. Book clubs are wildly enjoyable. And then there's talks, introducing people who've never heard of a cozy to the world of cozy mysteries and all their glorious elements. This is my favorite part of all. Thank you for joining us. We are the Cozy Mystery Quartet, ML Erdahl, Linda Hope Lee, Wendy Kendall, and me, Susan McCormick. Please like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode.